Hi, everyone. This is Lara again. I'm here with Nadia Smail. Uh, she is the Senior Manager of People and Growth at DoorDash. Hi, Hi Nadia. nice to meet you all. Hey, Lara. So tell me about you. Let's get this started. I um, have my master's in industrial and organizational psych, which is just a fancy way of saying business psychology. So we study people instead of numbers. It's like an MBA. Um, and through that work, I discovered my interest in diversity and inclusion because a lot of studying of people was discovering that there weren't places for me. Um, I'm a Muslim woman, I'm Palestinian, um, and I'm an American, and all of these intersections um, conflicted a lot in the workplace. So I was working while I was in school and um, discovered that the environments I were in were like inherently exclusive. Um, not because I was working with a bunch of racist people, but because they hadn't um, been around people of color or you know, the members of LGBTQ community or people that were differently abled. Um, and so through being in those spaces, I stumbled into diversity and inclusion work and um, moved from working in learning and development, which, was, uh, which is what people growth is, is training, um, to diversity and inclusion and, um, and learning and development. Love it. So tell me about your, so you work at DoorDash currently, and then you you have similar experiences at Patagonia doing the same kind of work. Um, maybe like walk us through your challenges, your experiences at both places. Um, and then what what was the most, what was the accomplishment that you had at both of these companies? Sure. So coming out of my master's while I was like working in learning and development, I again discovered that I needed to work in diversity and inclusion. And so I committed to myself that I wouldn't take another role unless diversity and inclusion was in its scope. Um, and so when work, when interviewing at Patagonia, the role actually was learning and development, but they you know committed to me that I could work on diversity and inclusion. And I was really excited about that. So in my time there, I sat on a diversity, equity, and inclusion council. We started an affinity group of color. Um, but the challenge was that you know, diversity and inclusion was never a priority for the company. It was a priority for me. And so they gave me permission to do the work. And so what I learned while being there is unless it is a priority of the business, you, your time, your money um, will not be put towards the work. And it became you know, emotionally taxing. So in my spare time, I was building a program on identity, power, and privilege. And I would allow teams to volunteer and take this program but there was no business metrics tied to it. Um, there was no obligation to attend and there was no obligation to create change. So, you know, fast forward even to current times, Patagonia is going through a tremendous amount of change because they had an exodus of people of color um, after I left. There was a lot of awareness that was brought to um, the lack of, of um, progress that they were willing to make. And so now they're really making that change. But I learned in myself through that process, and I hope that you all do as you enter the professional world, that everybody has a role in a movement. And my role was not to convince these people of the importance of the work of inclusion. I needed to be in a space where people understood that that was already important. So fast forward to working at DoorDash, um, I, was, um, I was introduced to a woman who started a department called Culture, Belonging, and People Growth. And so the work that we do for employee experience um, for, for communication and for learning and development is all through the lens of diversity and inclusion. So I have permission and mandate to not only teach managers about communication, but through the lens of anti-Blackness, through the lens of you know, being a parent at work and talking to them through um, biases that they may run into, um, working with the recruiting team to make sure that they have mitigating bias trainings for every single function. So they understand biases that can come up in engineering or in marketing. Um, talking through, you know, how to build brave spaces is another program that I've built. And really not just talking about inclusive leadership or building a safe space, but a place where people can actually take risk and, you know, feel accepted and actually welcomed to take risk because failure often leads to growth, right? And leads to innovation. So um, what I would say my accomplishments are um, moving through my professional career is that I'm not exactly where I want to be at this point, but I'm trending the right direction. You're finding places that fulfill your vision and your mission and allow you to do your work from a place of, you know, integrity. Um, and that's what I'm really grateful to do here. So 
now um, in my, I've been here for about two years, a little bit under two years. And the next phase of my work, I will be doing specifically team-based learning and development. So my portfolio will be to create experiences for teams that could be like the leaders of a department that could be an immediate team and help them focus on a specific challenge area they may have. So they may come into a training to do communication-based training, not knowing that we're gonna talk about social identity and we're gonna talk about the cycle of socialization and how those things impact different communication styles and how it's altering you know, your experience at work. Uh, because how you, you know, work at work is the same way you operate at your dinner table at home. It's the same way that you make decisions going to the voting booth. Like you can't separate these things. And so we wanna make sure that people really think holistically about how they operate and how they walk the world. This work started to be a lot more trendy than it was in the past. <laughs> Everybody's like, I am for Black Lives Matter, even if they have zero people of color on their team. So, right. and I've seen this happen in the design industry. I've seen this happen, you know, in the Midwest, all over the country, even all over the world, where everybody's starting to talk about these issues, even though they know it existed for so long, but they decided to just delete it from their mind. Um, how can we really influence with this work and not make it trendy and not yeah. make it just about the today? How, how does this work like live on beyond us and really create change and this ripple effect to people yeah. around us, next generation, all of that? When, when all of the civil unrest happened, like everybody and their mom, like you said, woke up and decided like, oh my God, police are hurting people. How did this happen? I need to learn about this. Train me on it. And I would say bet. what are you going to do on your team if I train you? Right? Like I will. It, so it was a wager. Like, how can we create a longer term impact if I give you this experience? Right. Um, to what end am I training you? Are you going to it, are we going to be working together next quarter to make sure that you are improving a structured interview process and incorporating the Rooney rule, which is a way to ensure that you are bringing in diverse individuals um, into your, your panels through every stage of an interview process? Are we, again, going to look at how you're delegating work and see what that delegation map looks like to see if there's opportunities? Um, we have programs of um, helping elevate like women of color at work. Are we going to ensure that you are going to nominate at least a few people on your team to be a part of these programs? So I think the way that we make sure that these things are sustainable is again, not to be obsessed with that, that carrot, but look at the people that are really committed to the work. Um, it initially really deterred me that there was like a bunch of people that woke up and decided that they wanted to do this work, right? It, I was like, who do you think you are? Like, this is, it felt offensive. Like we've been here doing this work forever. And now like, because white people are paying attention, suddenly there's like all this momentum. It was hurtful. But instead of looking at it that way, it's important to understand that like, we need men in a feminist movement. You need white people in a black movement. As a Palestinian, I need Israelis in a Palestinian movement. It is hard to say those words. It's not comfortable, but it's true. And so figuring out how to set standards and be true to those standards and then, you know, it, build coalitions and create, again, those long lasting goals is how we make sure these wor this work stands on. So on a really tactical level in the corporate world, I just made very visible goals that went all the way up to the vice president of that department and said like, this is what you're committing to, this is what the company's gonna see, um, and this is how we're moving the needle, right? Um, and if they weren't committed to it, then they didn't get the training. And then there became a, a demand and energy around the training. People wanted it. And so I said, great, what are you going to do? Right? Like this is not lip service. This isn't like a fun experience to make you feel warm and fuzzy inside because that's not what we need. Um, so I think it's important as an, as a professional, whether you are of a underrepresented talented group or not to have those standards to say, I'm committed to doing work with you, but to what end, right? And, um, you know, I'm in the business of creating change, are you? And if not, you know, choose someone else and being comfortable to say no, uh, because it was hard. It's hard to say no when you think that even it could be beneficial for your own career, but then understand like, what do I wanna, what foundation do I wanna build my career on, right? Like, is it worth building really strong relationships with people that are actually not going to create change? I don't want that on my track record. I want to like 
build with people that that have intention and maybe they fail, but they try. As a Palestinian American Muslim woman, how does this affect what you do and why you do DEI? And you did mention this a little bit in the beginning, but why does this matter to you to create these brave spaces for whether it's DoorDash or Patagonia or a small business or a nonprofit, why does it matter? Yeah, so the, the corny answer is everybody deserves an opportunity to do their best work, right? Um, the real answer is, and I actually heard this uh, something yesterday on Clubhouse, I was listening to a talk on Clubhouse that really resonated with me, which is, you know, like white men in Silicon Valley have been given like an exponential amount of money to just like dream and experiment and like have been given permission to like take risks and like try things. And other communities that do not represent the majority, um, again, be it being differently abled, be it being of a different, you know, on a the, the sexual spectrum, be it a person of color, have not been given the opportunity to dream and explore and just permission to innovate. And so collectively as a people, we're just missing out on so many things. We're missing out on solutions. We're missing out on, you know, um, opportunity to connect. And there is an expression in the DEI world, rising tide lifts all boats. Um, so any inclusive action you create actually is inclusive for everybody, right? If you think about walking down the street, you have likely been texting and use those like curb cuts on the side of the street so that you don't fall. Those curb cuts were actually created for folks in wheelchairs. The American Disability Association fought for them and they put them there. And now, you know, um, postal service men use them and women with their strollers. And again, people that are texting and walking, like it benefits everybody. So I think of that kind of curb cut effect where if people can understand the benefit of, of creating inclusive spaces, um, it's actually beneficial financially for companies if we have to convince that to them. It's beneficial for us as the most um, diverse LGBTQ and POC um, BIPOC community that's ever entered the workforce. It's beneficial for you know the future. It's beneficial for our children. So I think being a part of the future is probably one of the most important reasons for me. But as a as a Palestinian too, I think um, it's important to create uh, now, especially if you think about COVID, we're homing from work and working from home. So. I have permission now to bring my whole self to work. I have permission to talk about the intersectionality of when something does happen internationally that impacts my family, I can bring that into the workspace and say, this is impacting me now. And I'm going to ask that you educate yourself on it because your tax dollars go to this thing when that was never permissible before. Um, so creating spaces where people can really educate each other and allow people to see their whole selves, not because again, it's like corny and soft to like be bring your whole self to work, but because it allows you to do better work and it allows you to be happier ultimately at work. I think if I was an undergrad and I heard about somebody doing this work, I would think like, how the heck did you get there? What were the steps that you took to get there? And it was honestly just living a life of truth. That sounds really corny, but I started at like a recruiting firm and I was like a facilitator training sales. And I just decided that you know, I was going to continue to work to pursue what I felt was ethically right. Things find you that way, as long as you kind of maintain that standard for yourself. But a kind of North Star I have for myself is my children are going to ask me what I did. And I want to be able to say with conviction that I, that I chose to do, that I, that I walked the life I was proud of as like a God-fearing person. I want to say that I gave back to my community in the way that like our faith tells us to. I want to say that, um, I lived a life with conviction. And so it doesn't have to be grand gestures. Surround yourself around people that you're proud of um, and just continue to strive to do better. All you can do is be 1% better every day, right? You don't have to boil the ocean. We don't have to like liberate this country. It's gonna take all of us collectively doing small things. So just like live an honest life. Forgive yourself for your shortcomings when they happen, um, but trust your intentions, I think is, is the last thing I'll say.